So would you think about this question with me? Is prayer your steering wheel or your spare tire? <sighs> Corey Tim Boom quote, closed this question, excuse me, and um, it was brought to my attention last week when Carl and I saw the movie Forge. Have any of you seen the movie yet? I know Life360 House, you guys saw the movie. Yes, there is a lot of people that have seen the movie already. It is a wonderful movie um, by the Kendrick brothers, and I just want to encourage you to go see it. But in the movie, and don't worry, I'm not going to give anything away, but Miss Clara, who is a prayer warrior and a spiritual mother to many in the movie, she brings this question um, in the movie, and she, she says this. She says, many times we see prayer like a spare tire. We only take it out in emergency situations when really it should be our steering wheel. We should hold tightly to prayer. And that's what we're talking about today. This week we're looking at the topic of prayer. So what is prayer? Well, prayer is the act of communicating to God, with God, talking to God. It's a conversation where we speak to God, listen to him, and align our hearts with his will. In prayer we express our love and adoration we confess our sins, give thanks for his blessings, and present our needs and requests. It's more than just throwing up a big one to the man upstairs. It's a vital part of our relationship with God where we connect with him, we seek his guidance, and invite his presence and power into our lives. Prayer is direct access to our holy God. Prayer is mentioned over 650 times in the Bible, and there are 25 recorded prayers of Jesus in the Gospels, which are the first four books of the New Testament. We look to God's word for direction in prayer, as we should, and today, would you just hold your Bibles up with me as we make this declaration together? And if you would, would you just go ahead and stand? Let's go ahead and bring attention to the word of God today and say this declaration together. This is true. This is life. This is God's word. Father God, we just love you so much. God, and today as we focus on prayer, communicating with you, our Holy Father, God, would you open our hearts today? God, would you open our eyes and would you open our ears to listen to what you have? In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. You all may be seated. So in this series, we've been talking about the elements of a spirit-filled life. The elements that help shape a disciple. In the first week, Pastor Evelyn spoke on how spirit-filled disciples love God's word. And we find God in his word, the Bible. And last week, Pastor Garrett preached on the Holy Spirit. A spirit-filled disciples, we seek to live a continual spirit-baptized and spirit-led life. Just as the series title states, these are elemental they can seem basic, but I just want to encourage you today to lean in. Don't check out. Don't think, oh, I've heard this one before. God wants to teach us in his word about how to be better disciples. And I believe there are parts of God's character he wants to reveal to us if we allow ourselves to become better disciples and better followers of Jesus Christ in all that we do. If you're a new believer, these elements are so important to learning the rhythms of how you live as a Christ follower. Maybe you've been a believer for years, but you're stagnant in your walk with God. These messages are a reminder to ways that we can walk with God daily. Even if you're a mature believer, I believe that these are awesome reminders and ways that we can be encouraged and thank God for where he has brought us. When we follow, when we follow disciplines, they bring healthy habits. And healthy habits bring transformation in our lives. Time spent in prayer transforms our lives. It changes our thoughts, our attitude, our perspective. When we set up a discipline of prayer, we are growing in our relationship with God, the King of kings and the creator of the universe. As believers, God's spirit lives in us. His Holy Spirit dwells in us. So prayer is a relational aspect of our walk. If you have your Bibles and you've probably already opened them to 1 Thessalonians 5.17, I'm going to just read a scripture to you today. Verse 17 says this, never stop praying. If you have a different passage or a different translation, it, it might say to pray unceasingly, to continually pray. 
That is probably the shortest passage I've ever read to give a basis for a message before. And I will probably never start by reading such a short part ever again. But (laughs) just as I said that prayer is mentioned over 650 times, we will be reading all of those. I'm just kidding. (laughs) We will be reading a lot of parts of scripture today that talk about prayer. These passages we've put in our Life360 church app, so don't expect you to find them as we go to each one. I might be reading rather quickly through some of them, but you can follow along in the church app. So think of your favorite person with me, if you will. It could be your parent. It could be your best friend. If you are married, it better be your spouse. (laughs) Who is the first person that you want to tell if something really funny happens to you at work or school? Or when you've had the worst day of your life, who do you run to? Our relationship with that person should be like the relationship we have with our Heavenly Father. We should be in constant communication with Him. It should be a continual conversation. Text messaging is the norm now. How many of you have a constant text communication with one of your best friends? And you don't ever say, hello, good morning, how are you doing? You pick up where you left off. You could go to sleep talking about one thing and then you wake up the next morning and you just start talking about something else. You don't say good morning, you don't say how are you doing, unless you're my mom. She always starts with good morning, how are you today? Because that's my mom and she is the most precious person in the world. (laughs) But I do that. I do that. I I go to sleep talking to someone about one thing, and then I wake up the next morning, and I start talking about something else. Our prayer life with God should be continual conversation with him. So what is prayer not? Prayer is not magical repetition or recitation. We don't just say the words as fast as we can, and if we get it all in the right order, he hears us. The Lord's Prayer is powerful, and it's special, and it's in the Gospel of Matthew. Jesus taught us how to pray using the Lord's Prayer. It's foundational. It gives us a wonderful way that we can communicate with our Father. But if we just say those words without meaning, is it really talking to God? If you close your eyes really tight and say, Our Father, and how now and hallowed be thy name, and keep me coming, your will be done, and start to have a good, so daily bread, amen. Oh, I prayed today. Cool. No. That is a prayer, but if you were just saying it to get the words out and you're not meaning it from your heart, it is not a heart posture. Is it prayer? I remember as a little kid, I had different prayers I would say for different things, and I would say a a meal prayer, and I would say a bedtime prayer, and sometimes if I was really tired, or I was completely unfocused on what I was supposed to be doing, my parents would come in to start prayers, and I would say my bedtime prayers like this. God, thank you for this day. Bless this food to our bodies. I wasn't paying attention. I was on autopilot. Prayer should not be on autopilot. Prayer is not a vending machine. It's not manipulation or a grocery list. Prayer is not transactional. It is transformational. If I say this, then this will happen. That is not prayer. We do not say things to God in order to get something from him. Should we ask God for things? Oh, yes. We should come to our Heavenly Father for everything, but we do not do it as an act of transaction. Prayer is surrendering our will to God's. Just as Jesus was in the garden before he was arrested and later crucified, he prayed, not my will, but yours. When we align our will with God's, he, we receive better than what we could ever give ourselves or what we could ever think he would give us prayer is a two-way street we don't just give god a grocery list and expect him to check off the items for us do you ever walk up to that favorite person and say hey how are you doing thanks for being awesome today my car needs fixed and uh, i need you to pay my bills and my kid's sick so could you take care of that awesome thanks have a good day and walk away no prayer is talking and listening to god Prayer is not a last resort. Again, it's not that spare tire that you just take out when you really need it. It should be the first thing you do in all situations. When Carl and I were first married and we were living in Montana, we were driving home from a ministry event, 
And if you know anything about Montana, any drive is a very long drive. And so I was sleeping. And the wind was blowing very hard. And about that time, there was a semi who lost his tire chocks. Carl told me that's what they were called. They are like block up the tire. And so at some point, it must have blown off the semi when it was driving down the road. And they lost track of it. Well, we came up over a hill, and we drove right into that block, causing us to lose control. And at that moment, I sat up straight out, and all I said was, Jesus, first thing on my mind. He was not my last resort. He was our first option. His hand was on us. We didn't wreck. We rubbed a flat spot in our tires. But we did not wreck that day when we call on Jesus. See, when you're in continual, unceasing conversation, it's much easier for him to be the first one you call out to. Prayer is more than a ritual or a list of requests. It's a lifeline that connects us to God, empowers us for his mission, and transforms us from the inside out. Our big idea today is this. A spirit-filled disciple enjoys solitude in God's presence and regularly engages in corporate prayer for God's mission to go forward. Now, the solitude part might be pretty easy for many of us. Of course, you might pray in the car, in your room. But corporate prayer includes those times that we pray together as a family or with a group of friends or even in our services here when we pray for co-laborers each week. Did you know that we should also pray out loud when we are by ourselves? I know that if we take 1 Thessalonians 5.17 to heart, it's impossible to pray continually out loud. You just, you just can't do it when you're talking to other people. But there are times when we have an attitude of prayer as we are going through the daily part of our life. However, there are times when it is crucial to, play, to pray excuse me, out loud. It's healthy. It's edifying to our own selves, to our own faith. Praying out loud helps us to focus on what we are saying. Have you ever tried to pray and close your eyes and you're not really saying the things out loud and you're just praying in your head and all of a sudden you start thinking about what you need to do the next 15 minutes? You need to start thinking about what the kids need from Walmart. It's the really easy to lose focus. Pray out loud. It's even biblical. Psalm 142, 1 and 2. David writes, with my voice I cry out to the Lord. With my voice I plead for mercy to the Lord. I pour out my complaint before him. I tell my trouble before him. David used his voice. We may even use different postures as do we pray. There's not just one way to pray. A lot of times movies and art portray it as people kneeling with their hands clasped. That's a really good way to pray, but sometimes we can sit, stand. There might be times when you are face down before our Father in prayer. Some people, you might even go on a prayer walk. You can pray when you drive, pray when you're working, you can pray on a roller coaster, you can pray anywhere at any time. We can pray continually, and we should also pray intentionally. As we walk through this message, I want us to focus on four key aspects of disciples' prayer life. First, hearing and obeying God's voice. Second, partnering with God in intercession and spiritual warfare. Three, managing our emotions through prayer. And four, walking in forgiveness. So let's look into God's word and see how we can grow into each of these areas. The first one is disciples hear and obey God's voice. As disciples, one of our most important tasks is to learn to hear and obey God's voice. God desires to guide us and teach us the way that we should go. Psalm 32, 8 says, The Lord says, I will guide you along the best way, best pathway for your life. I will advise you and watch over you. But how do we hear God's voice in a world full of noise? It begins in a place of prayer. Isaiah 54 and 5 paints a picture of a disciple who listens attentively. It says, This sovereign Lord has given me his words of wisdom so that I might know how to comfort the weary. Morning by morning he awakens me and opens my understanding to his will. The sovereign Lord has spoken to me and I have listened. I have not rebelled or turned away. And then in John 10, 27, Jesus himself said this, My sheep listen to my voice. I know them and they follow me. 
As we cultivate a habit of listening in prayer, we learn to distinguish God's leading from our own ideas. We begin to trust his voice, even when it leads us in unexpected directions. Sometimes it's a whisper, a still small voice. And sometimes it is clear and unavoidable and you know without a shadow of a doubt that the Lord is speaking to you in that moment. Even if it is not audible, there are times when you know it is the Lord. When I was growing up, we had um, quite a few kids in our neighborhood, and there was a boy who moved in third grade, and his name was Evan. And he lived like a street down from us, but he would always come up to our street and play. And we lived in this part on the parking lot of the church, not on the parking lot of the church, but like we lived in the parsonage and our house was like right next to the parking lot. And it was the best skating rink anyone could ever imagine. But Evan would come up a lot of times to play. But when it was time to go home, all his dad had to do was step out on his front porch and whistle. And the entire neighborhood heard it. And I can't whistle for you, so I'm not going to do it. There you go. (laughs) It was really loud and obnoxious, I will say. (laughs) There you go. Evan knew his dad's voice. His dad didn't have to do it two times. One time. It was an immediate acknowledgement and obedience. Studies have shown that babies recognize the voice of their mom while in the womb. Isn't that precious? They haven't even seen their mom, but they know her voice. Just as sheep know the voice of their shepherd, Evan knows the voice of his dad's whistle. Unborn babies know the voice of their mother, and we too should know the voice of the Lord. We should practice hearing the voice of God during our times of prayer. Remember Pastor Garrett's illustration last week of the radio waves? Those radio waves are all around us. And when we tune in, we allow ourselves to hear the Holy Spirit, and it comes in more clearly. When we pray, take time to listen. Make it a conversation with God. Allow him to speak to you in those times. Again, it may not be audible, but his Holy Spirit guides us and speaks to our hearts. So to hear the voice of God while praying, sometimes we need to sit in silence. It's not easy to do. But sometimes we need to shut off the phone. We need to turn off the TV. We need to remove the distractions in our lives that keep us from hearing the voice of God. Spirit-filled disciples hear and obey God's voice. Number two, disciples partner with God in intercessory prayer. Did you know prayer is not just talking about God or talking to God about our own needs? It's about partnering with God for his purposes on earth. 2 Chronicles 7, 14 reminds us, Then if my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, I will hear from heaven and will forgive their sins and restore their land. In 1 Timothy 2, 1 through 4, Paul urges us to pray for all people. He says, I urge you, first of all, to pray for all people, asking God to help them, intercede on their behalf, and give thanks for them. Pray this way for kings and all who are in authority so that we may live peaceful and quiet lives marked by godliness and dignity. This is good and pleases God our Savior, who wants everyone to be saved and to understand the truth. Now, intercessory prayer is a pretty big word. But simply put, it means to pray on behalf of someone else. So you probably intercede and you might not even know it. You just didn't even know the name of it. Did you know that Jesus is the best example of an intercessor? Romans 8, 34 states, Who then will condemn us? No one. For Christ Jesus died for us and was raised to life for us, and he is sitting in the place of honor at God's right hand, pleading for us. He is pleading interceding on our behalf, standing in the gap. Intercessory prayer and spiritual warfare are powerful tools God has given us to stand in the gap for others, trusting him for their salvation, deliverance, healing, and reconciliation. Ephesians 6, 18 reminds us to pray in the spirit on all occasions and with all kinds of prayers and requests. 
With this in mind, be alert and always keep on praying for all of the Lord's people. Just before that, in that verse, Paul is giving instructions in Ephesians 6 on the armor of God, and he's telling us to put on the helmet of salvation, the shield of faith, the sword of the spirit, the breastplate of righteousness, the shoes of the gospel of peace, and the belt of truth. And then he says to pray. Prayer is a weapon. We may intercede for those who are sick. We may intercede for our government leaders. We may intercede for our boss. When we join together in a prayer circle, maybe it's in a life group, or when you come up to the front to pray for someone at church, that's intercession. Our salvation wall in the lobby, if you're new and you've been here in the last few months, there's a wall out here that has names on it. It's plastered with hundreds of names and those are people who we desire to see come to know Jesus as their Lord and Savior. It's friends, it's family members, it's neighbors. We continue to pray for them. Our prayer team regularly prays for them. Intercession is how we align ourselves with God's will for others and not our own. It's a way to build our faith in God. Spirit-filled disciples hear and obey God's voice we partner with God in intercessory prayer. And number three, spirit-filled disciples manage emotions through prayer. Life can be overwhelming, and our emotions can often feel like they're out of control. But the Bible gives us a powerful key to managing our emotions, bringing them to God in prayer. Philippians 4, 6, and 7 encourages us, don't worry about anything. Instead, pray about everything. Tell God what you need and thank him for all he has done. Then you will experience God's peace, which exceeds anything we can understand. His peace will guard our hearts and minds as you, as you live in Christ Jesus. Prayer is the place where we bring our worries, our fears, and our anxieties to God. In exchange, we receive his peace. This peace guards our hearts and minds, enabling us to face life's challenges with the calm assurance that God is in control. What if instead of trying everything first and then bringing our emotions to God, what if we start with that? What if prayer is our first response and not our last resort? Is prayer our spare tire or our steering wheel? Well, God, I've tried counting to 10 for these anxiety attacks and uh, they don't work, so I guess I'll try you next. Is he our steering wheel or our spare tire? I firmly believe in counseling and therapy. But what if we come to God first before we talk to someone else? Give our anxieties to and fear to God first. I believe he will guide us. There is truly a need for psychologists and doctors in this world. There may be circumstances where our bodies are not making the right chemicals or hormones and, and in our brains, and we need help with that. But start with the Heavenly Father who created you and knows every part of your body better than any doctor or counselor could. Prayer shifts our focus and our perspective off of ourselves and focuses on the most holy God. He transforms our minds and changes our perspective in ways that no one and nothing else can. When I was about four years old, I had nightmares, horrible nightmares very bad. They were waking me up at night. They were waking my parents up at night. It was a very difficult time. Scary. I was fearful of bedtime. But my parents encouraged me, and I remember my mom just, just encouraging me and reminding me to pray memory verses. And I was four. And I knew Genesis 1-1 and John 3-16. So, I just woke up one time after a nightmare, and I remember saying, Jesus, help me. And then I started saying the only verses I knew, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that who should ever believe in him would not perish but have everlasting life. Do you know the peace that that gave me as a four-year-old child in my room to know that Jesus was there with me? He was my steering wheel in that moment. When we come to God with worry, anxiety, anger, whatever emotion, he gives us peace. 
Spirit-filled disciples hear and obey God's voice. We partner with God in intercessory prayer. We manage our emotions with prayer. And number four, spirit-filled disciples walk in forgiveness through prayer. Forgiveness is a central theme in the Christian life. It's profound and challenging, and prayer is where we both receive and extend it. Now, I'm giving my husband the benefit of the doubt because he asked if I wanted to run this message by him earlier or last night, and I said no. So he didn't know that I would be referencing the Lord's Prayer when he said it this morning in worship. So don't give him a hard time. It's okay, and it fit. But in Matthew 6, 9 through 15, Jesus teaches us the Lord's Prayer, which includes this powerful line, and forgive us our sins as we have forgiven those who sin against us. Jesus follows with this sobering reminder. If you forgive those who sin against you, your heavenly Father will forgive you. But if you refuse to forgive others, your Father will not forgive your sins. This is not a suggestion. It's an essential part of our walk with God because he forgave us. We must also forgive others. This is going to be a hard one for some of us. When we come before God, we are reminded of the grace and mercy he has extended to us. And in the quiet moments of confession, God's forgiveness washes over us. And we are empowered to extend that same grace to those who wronged us. The more we experience God's forgiveness, the more we are compelled to forgive others. James 5.16 encourages us, confess your sins to each other and pray for each other so that you may be healed. The earnest prayer of a righteous person has great power and produces wonderful results. I grew up learning the King James Version, and it says, the effectual fervent prayer of a righteous man availeth much. And that sounds so much cooler to me. (laughs) When we pray, we should ask forgiveness for our sins. We should also ask God to help us to forgive others who have wronged us. Why? Why? Well, Psalm 16, or 66, 18 says, If I had not confessed the sin of my heart, the Lord would not have listened. You see, unforgiveness is an attitude of holding on to a sin against us and not surrendering it to the God. It puts a wedge in our relationship with him. It's a poison that takes hold of our lives and can lead to bitterness and a hard heart. And the enemy uses this unforgiveness to hinder our relationship with God. It's a choice we must be willing to make in order to have right relationship with him. It's not just about letting someone off the hook. Forgiveness is healing. So who do we forgive? Forgive the person who cut you off on Campbell yesterday. Forgive the person who talked about you bad at work. Forgive the person who lied to the teacher about you. Forgive the person who hurt, hurt you so deeply as a child that you have continual thoughts about the pain. Forgive yourself for making the choices in life that have led you to where you are today. Imagine what our homes, our workplaces, and our church would look like if forgiveness became our default response. Through prayer, we can ask God to soften our hearts, help help us let go of grudges, and build bridges where there have been walls. As spirit-filled disciples, prayer is not just an obligation. It's a joy and it's a privilege. It's in prayer that we hear God's voice We partner with him in his work. We manage our emotions and walk in forgiveness. Can we forget, commit today to being people of prayer, both in our personal lives and together as the body of Christ, trusting that as we do, God's mission will go forward with power. A spirit-filled disciple enjoys solitude in God's presence and regularly engages in corporate prayer for God's mission to go forward. Prayer should be the heartbeat of our lives. It should be our steering wheel. Seeking solitude in his presence and joining together in corporate prayer for his kingdom to come on earth as it is in heaven. So how do we live this out? What are some practical action steps to creating a life of prayer? Number one is this. Daily quiet time. Dedicate time each morning to sit quietly before God. Ask the Holy Spirit to speak to you. And be ready to follow his guidance throughout your day. 
for new disciples or those who are nearer, newer in their walk, this may look like about five minutes. A prayer life develops much like the life of a child who starts by crawling and then by walking and then by running. Or maybe the relationship with a friend. This conversation can seem awkward at first and the silence is a little awkward and you're not sure what to say, but then over time your talks are long and full. Allow your silence to grow the same way. When we are quiet, we allow the voice of God to be more clear in our lives. Number two is create an intercession list. Write down two or three people or situations where you sense God is asking you to pray. Commit to praying for them daily, believing that God is working even when you don't see it. Remember that salvation wall out in the lobby? There are hundreds of names of people who need to know Jesus. Take a moment on Sundays or Wednesdays or maybe you have time during the week and come and pray for those names. Stand in the gap for those souls. Number three, prayer for emotions. The next time you feel overwhelmed by emotions, pause and pray. Tell God exactly how you feel. I guarantee you he already knows. And ask him to fill you with his peace and comfort. Number four is forgiveness check. Take a moment this week or even today to think about your relationships. If the Holy Spirit brings unforgiveness to mind, confess it to him and choose to forgive. Make it a habit to regularly pray for God's grace to forgive others. So how should we respond today? Well, if you would, all across this room, would you just stand with me? First of all, maybe you're in this room and, again, you've thought of prayer as throwing one up to the big guy upstairs. Or you don't know how to pray even though you know you should. Or maybe it's just that you don't have a relationship with Jesus. Today on either side of this room, there are prayer team members. We've all sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. Sin separates us from God. And Jesus, the best mediator, the best intercessor, made a way for us to have a relationship with him by dying for our sins and raising back to life. Do not live another day without choosing to follow Jesus. If you want to make that decision today, then come up. If you don't want to do it alone, ask somebody to come with you. I'm just going to take a moment. You don't have to do it alone. But if that's you today and you want to start a relationship with Jesus, come up to one of these prayer team members and I'll just wait for a moment. Okay, the next thing is this. As spirit-filled disciples, I want us to practice corporate prayer today. Many times for response, we come up to the front and get alone with God. It's totally okay. It's purposeful, it's meaningful in so many situations. But today, before we start moving out into the rooms, before we move anything else, today I would like for as many of us who can to come up and make their way to the front. Is the front more spiritual? No. But it gets us out of the place where we've been sitting for the last hour and puts us in a different position. Let's begin by all of us calling on God, asking him to help us hear his voice, Let's intercede for those in our lives. Let's ask God to help us with our emotions and ask him to help us forgive. Now as we pray, to remember that it's talking to God and let's practice speaking it out. Prayers don't have to be eloquent with these and thous. Talk with him in reverence, but talk to him as if he's here in the room with us because he is. Let's join together and pray. Father God, we love you. God, we thank you that you are holy and that there is none like you. God, we thank you that you have given us prayer as a way to communicate with you. God, I thank you that we can hear your voice and obey. And Lord, I just pray today for everyone in this room, God, that they will hear your voice and that they will obey. God, I thank you that you have given us the gift of intercession 
and that through your son Jesus, God, we can come to you. Lord, I pray for those who are in this room. God, that they would come to know you in this real way. Lord, that they would begin to intercede for those around them. God, that they would pray for those and stand in the gap for those who don't know you. God, when there are needs in their life, God, when their friend's life and their family member's life, God, would they come to you? Lord, I thank you that you help us manage our emotions. Lord, I thank you that you created us as emotional beings. And Father, I just pray, God, that we come to you first. God, that you help us to manage our anxieties, our angers. Lord, we can take our fears to you. And God, I just pray that you trade those out for peace. And God, I pray that today you help us to forgive those who have sinned against us. Lord, this is not an easy one. Forgiveness is so hard. It's hard to give it up. But God, I just pray that today we begin to let go of those things that hold us. God, those things that draw a wedge between you and us, Father. God, we love you and we thank you. We thank you for your word. God, we thank you for speaking, speaking to us in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Now, before we go anywhere, before we begin to make our exit, I want us to do this because prayer is talking to and listening to God. So we're going to take 30 seconds. It might seem long for some of you, but we're going to take 30 seconds in silence and we're just going to allow him to speak to us. The keys aren't going to be playing. No one should be talking. And let's just wait on God. Father, I thank you that you speak to us. Lord, I pray as we begin to practice silence in our prayer time, God, that our hearts would be tuned to you. God, that we would hear your voice so loud and clear and that we would obey. Father, again, I just thank you for this time. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. We love you all. Thank you so much for being with us today. If you are new and want to be with Pizza with the Pastors, it's an auditorium too. Have a wonderful day. God bless.